So we can begin if you want. Anybody have any questions, comments? Uh, Phil, no Moustache, you have any questions? <laughs> uh, no, not at the moment. I will, uh, something will bubble up, I'm sure. I'm sure. So uh, let's start with a little meditation, visualization uh, exercise here for fun. Let you just take a deep breath, close your eyes for a minute, and uh, relax. <clears throat> And think about why you decided to join this group, this process. What was going on for you that you decided to become a part of this? And how is it so far? How is it working out? Has anything changed for you? Has anything shifted? Or maybe how many things have shifted? That might be a better question. Have you changed? What have you learned about yourself? And where would you like to go? What other changes would you like to make? Think about one of your past successes and go back there in your mind as an observer. Watch yourself in this past situation as though you're watching somebody else. And now jump into your body in that past situation so like you're being your, that past you in that situation. What kind of energy could you bring forward into today? What do you think you need to focus on in the present? And when you're ready, just come on back. Come on down. <laughs> Open your eyes whenever you're ready. How was that? Naomi? It's... It was good. I mean, it's like my mind is like a ping pong. Like my mind went all different areas. But it was able to kind of settle down a little bit. So, get clarity. Yeah.
so that little exercise that we just did, I mean that little process, right? A couple of minutes. I don't know too many people, if I know anybody that I can think of that does that kind of exercise on a regular basis. But to me, that's the essence of what we're doing. I.e. sending our mind to a different time and a different place and gathering information from that time and that place. And then maybe, you know, bringing it forward. So to my mind, that kind of exercise is so valuable, and yet most people don't do it, have never heard of it, or they would dismiss it, saying it, you know, there's no point to it. I would say that is the point. <laughs> Using your mind to do that kind of inner exploratory Traveling, right? Mental time travel. Any questions? Any comments? About anything? Yes? Um, no, not really. I mean, what came up for me in the end was what I've been focusing on lately, which is more like what needs to go what's getting in my way and so that's well as soon as I came out of it I wrote down what doesn't belong right and so for me that's sort of what's starting to bubble up a lot for for this year moving forward it's like it's not about adding more new it's more about getting rid of the stuff that doesn't really belong and doesn't get me where I want to go so that's that's a big one for me right now so what are you going to get rid of um, there's some people I need to get rid of. There's, um, uh, yeah, like this project that I've been working on for a while now needs to be done. I need to be done with it. Um, it's getting in my way. Um, that's really been coming up lately. Um, yeah. So stuff like that. Yeah. It's easy to get people out of your life. All you have to do is just ignore them, you know, stop, <laughs> stop communicating with them, right? <laughs> Which I did. I got rid of somebody uh, last this past week, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing uh, sinister, I hope. I mean, uh, do, do, do we need to phone the police and say, hey, if you're looking for... They're still for breathing. Them, you know, <laughs> Don't worry, they're still breathing. Oh, yes, yeah. we're good. We're good. It sounded yeah. a bit sinister. Uh, yeah, no, no. I would never admit that on camera. <laughs> By the way, do you know what the word sinister means? Mm -mm. Left-handed. No. Left-handed. It means left. Yeah. Sinestra. Yes. So left hand is right brain. Hmm. So the right brain is sinister. That's your creative side, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. But it's also the, the great trickster, as John hmm. Kehoe calls it. You know, it's the... It's the explainer, right? According to um, the doctor who won the Nobel Prize for his work in the split brain research. Uh, I can't think of his name just off the top of my head, but he uh, it's in my book and I've talked about him before. I'll think of him in a minute. So this is week 55, which is a milestone, <laughs> right? We've done 55 of these, 56 actually, but as I mentioned before, Phil might not know. One of them I forgot to record, so this is 55 official ones, but it's number 56 all, all together. So, um, so what... What shifts have you made or are you making, Naomi? What are you working on these days? What what kind of changes are you 
creating, uh, dealing with? As soon as you asked that question, someone came in the house. So go to the rest and I'll be right back. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say uh, <clears throat> that the that in the uh, exercise, uh, visualizations and whatnot, um, what came up for me, uh, sort of like Je uh, Jessica, uh, just all of the, the, the distractions and the habits that are in my way. You know, um, th there's the things I have to do and the things that um, that uh, are totally optional, but uh, but there's a uh, you know sort of a deep uh, groove, or I guess you could call a rut, that you know is kind of goes across my path because I want to want to change direction and uh, and uh, achieve some of these goals and some of these dreams that I'm <laughs> going to try to put put into my book. Yeah, do, do you want to say what it is? Uh, do you want to flesh it out a little bit or not? Uh, well, it, it, it's. As I as I said uh, in the earlier sessions, I you know I want to get things out of my way and, and uh, finally achieve uh, some success in uh, my network marketing uh, businesses. Right. You know, have a breakthrough. Right. Have you ever had a breakthrough before? Uh, sort of. Uh, I've been on the verge of them uh, a, a couple of times. Uh, one of the ones, uh, you know, looking back, uh, I, I was just—I so, felt like I was on the verge of having a breakthrough, and then uh, I had a uh, a retina detachment. And it took me, you know, after three eye surgeries and, uh, you know, kind of, you know, having to limit my activity for uh, most of the year. And then, uh, and then, you know, it just totally set me back. And uh, Yeah, I remember that. Have you, so have you ever had a breakthrough? Have you experienced that? Um... Well, I've had, you know, some feelings of achievement. You know, I was thinking about uh, things that I have succeeded in doing. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've experienced, uh, there's a feeling that I know, which, which is uh, having uh, what I call flow, you know, where uh, things just kind of, go along naturally i've got good energy nothing is stopping me and um i've had those enough that i know it, what it is but i'm frustrated because uh it's it's hard to get there i've had a lot of experience in sales and um uh and whenever i would take a vacation or even just over a weekend you know i'd have to recreate the flow that um, I mean, I have, I don't have to overcome a uh, call reluctance, you know, just uh, telephone you know, just, Well, you know, so the, the thing that seemed to work for me was to, to pick the low hanging fruit first, you know, right. and take, do the, do the easy, easy ones. And then that would get me into the flow so that I could step up to, uh, more challenging, uh, conversations. So can you remember a time when you were in that flow state? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, 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 it, and it built because, uh, you know, like I felt like I, you know, I would, as I hung up the phone, I, uh, I would just give myself a, a real big pat on the back. I just say, you, you know, you know, you really, uh, express that clearly and uh you know uh, you know you, you, you know you did you did you know you were you did great <laughs> yeah so that was a win so, 
Yeah, yeah, I felt like I was winning. Yeah, definitely. Now, is that on your past successes list? Um, yeah, there might be. There, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about my past successes this morning, uh, coming into the call. Uh, I need, you know, I, you know, I've been kind of working in my mind rather than putting it down on paper here uh, yet, but... Uh, uh, actually, that is probably the thing that uh, just like, yeah, I guess it's like that's the low hanging fruit, you know, because it's, uh, you know, of this process. You know, there are there are more, much more challenging uh, subject areas uh, that I you know need to build up to. So. Um, yeah, so I have a few things in mind. Um, so here's with my with my with, with organizations I've been involved with uh, where I was in leadership and uh, and 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 achievements that I had in that in that process. Right. Well, what I would do, what I would recommend you do, is make a list of those times mm -hmm. and do that exercise that we just did. In other words, go back to that time mm -hmm. and. Teach your body what it feels like. Do it as a habit, you know, develop it to the point where you can just instantly generate that feeling. Because that's what you want, right? You want to be in that state. Yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. So this is... This is the... Um, the insight, you know, one of the insights, I guess, that I got, which is that the feelings that we want to feel, they exist in the past, as we just talked about, right? Mm -hmm. You feeling like, like a winner in a flow state, you know, feeling powerful, feeling, you know, I, I just did something great there, you know. So... That, that situation, that event, that time, you know, that place in inner space time, that is a place that you need, well, I don't want to say need, but I would say uh, learn how to feel that feeling again. Because all our feelings, you know, they're all habits. Right? Like every word that you say, you learned how to say it. There was one time when you didn't know that word. I think the same thing is exactly true for feelings. Now, the big mistake that most people make, 99.999% .999 of the population, as far as I can tell, they make the same mistake which is they try and get to that feeling by doing something now. Well, that's difficult. I mean, look how much time it took you in the past to get to that place, right? You may have tried a hundred different things and had like, oh, one huge win, right? So if you've had one huge win and you, even for a brief time, you were in that emotional state where you might call it a flow state or a peak state or something like that. All you need is one. And just by doing that exercise that we just did, you know, you revisit that time, you see yourself there, you jump into your body, you get the feeling, you know, you breathe it in, you look around, use all your senses, you know, what did you see, what did you hear, what did you feel at that point in time. And literally, think of yourself as like practicing a, a piece on the piano or practicing a, you know, a juggling routine or a dance step, something like that, where you just do it over and over and over and over and over again until it just becomes automatic, like you can just put yourself into that state instantly. Because that's your power state, right? That's your power spot. That that point in time, that's that's the place when you were at your 
well, not necessarily the peak. I'm not saying it was the peak experience, but I mean, it was certainly a time when you were in a state <coughs> that you would like to get into again, right? So that's, that's the process. That's the value of the past successes list is to identify those places in the past that have those experiences for us, those feelings, right? And to literally feel them over and over and over again until it becomes a part of who we are. We just become that person, right? And so, yeah, that to me, that's like, that might be the basic exercise that we're talking about for the last 55 weeks. Identifying a place and a state that we have felt before and then repeating it enough, thinking about it enough and feeling it enough. That's the idea, feeling it, right? The thing is, if you, if you see yourself at a distance doing that, then you're not there, right? Because you, you're at a distance. So that's called being disassociated in terms of NLP. That's what they call being disassociated. So you're disassociated from that feeling. But when you get into your body and you can feel it, literally, it's like you're right back there, you know? You can remember talking to that person, making that sale or whatever it was. That's the energy that you want now in the, in the present, right? Yeah, uh, the thing I, I'm thinking about several situations when I had, they, 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 I guess you would call them peak experiences. And um, <laughs> yeah, literally in my body, like I just was, you know, tingling all over. Exactly, exactly. So that's the state. Like the hair was going to almost standing up, uh, standing right. up the back of my neck. You know? Exactly. Well, that's what yeah. happens when we achieve a goal, right? Like when we work on something that's important to us and we achieve it, then that's what happens. You know, we kind of get this, ooh, I, I don't quite believe it, you know. Yeah. Right? Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So the trick is treat it as though it's a piece, you know, that you're trying to learn to play on the guitar or on the piano or it's a juggling trick that you're trying to perfect. You know, uh, you know, you would do it over and over and over and over and over again, maybe a thousand times. Mm -hmm. And then finally you could do it. Right. And then eventually it would be it, it would be unconscious and you could play that ple that piece on the piano while you're talking to your friends. Right. You're at a party and you're playing this piece and you're chatting, you know, with the friend, you know, you don't even have to pay much attention to it because it's an automatic thing. Right. So that's that's the idea is to identify a state, a feeling, an emotion that we want to literally kind of build into our personality. Right. And do it enough so that it just becomes automatic. That that's how we feel, right? And so that's cultivating our inner garden, as I call it sometimes. And so working from that state, you know, you can, you're sort of invincible when you're in that state, right? Yeah. I mean, this is what actors do, right? I mean, this is what Michael Gambon did when he was in The Singing Detective. He put himself in this weird state where he was like this, you know, angry, frustrated, bitter, you know, sick guy in the hospital. And I'm sure it took him some work to get there. And once he was there and once the show was over, he didn't want to go back there because it was a it was a really terrible state to be in. But that was his job as an actor. Right. So it's the same kind of process for me and you, but it's. And in this case, it's a positive state that we want to recreate, right? Yeah, and when it's you no can, wonder, it's no wonder <clears throat> Michael Gabon didn't want to, didn't even care to, to watch the show. He no, like, I, I don't want to go there again. <laughs> exactly, he didn't want to experience that again. He didn't want to feel that again, right? Whereas, in it, whereas in our case, what we're trying to do is we want to go there again. Exactly. Yeah, and that's what we want. That, so that's the other side. But it's 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 the same process, really. You know. Uh, on the one hand, it's a negative state because he was acting this role. 
but in our case, it's a positive state, right? So I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of how I do this, right? Um, I told the story before, um, a few weeks ago, I think, I told the story about how in my last year of high school, I kind of changed personalities. You know, I became, when I was in about grade five, I can remember, I can remember doing this, you know. <clears throat> I was doing my homework one night. I was in grade five. So I was like 10, you know, something like that. And I suddenly realized that if I did a certain thing in my mind, which I would now call, you know, focusing my attention, you know, just kind of channeling my energy, focusing my attention. If I concentrated my mind in a certain way, that I could really master this homework that I was doing. And so as a consequence, I became a top student because I learned how to focus like that, right? And that made me the teacher's pet. I was golden boy, you know, all through school. Right up until the last year of high school, when I lost it and I became I just lost that feeling that focus you know and so I decided to adopt a different personality and I decided to become a loser whereas I'd been a winner for like you know around eight or nine years I was a winner I was the teacher's pet I was like oh look Anthony here's getting top marks, you know, blah, 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 right? And I became really, really comfortable with that self-image that I was this kind of, you know, top student, right? And then for, you know, various reasons, uh, I lost that and I made a decision one day and it took me years. I mean, this is, I'm talking 30, 40 years to figure this out, right? What happened to me, right? And what I would say now is I just lost my self-image. And so I needed to adopt another self-image. And so I decided to become a loser because nobody recognized me as being one of the winners anymore because I was in a new school, a new environment, new situation. Nobody knew me. None of the teachers knew me. And so I decided to identify with a different crowd. And I chose the losers because I thought they're easy to become a part of. All you have to do is complain, talk about how bad your life is, how much you hate the teachers, how much you hate the school system, what jerks your parents are, what kind of jerks the government are, and everybody in the losers category, they all agree with you, right? So you fit right in. <laughs> so that was my that was my strategy and it was more or less unconscious I mean I was not aware of this right all I knew was I didn't fit in I felt like I was you know totally out in left field and the place I used to be which was among the winners I didn't fit there anymore for you know whatever reason and so I decided to become a loser you know and so I became a loser and so for like for like the next 10 years, that's where I lived. I lived in the land of I'm a loser. And eventually my life got to be such a drag that I had to snap out of it. I had to get out of it, you know. And the way I got out of it was t studying mind power, learning about meditation, taking some courses in visualization, and, and then I was on this new path, you know. But the problem is that I can still snap into that loser personality if I'm not careful. And when I'm in that loser personality, life is difficult. I don't have any confidence. You know, I feel I hesitate. I sort of, I procrastinate. I, you know, I anticipate rejection. I have an idea for something and I sort of go, oh, you know, nobody's going to be interested in this. Well, that's the loser part of me, right? So 
what I did eventually was I figured out, okay, I need to, I need to connect back with that winner part. So I remembered that evening doing my homework when I got that insight, hey, if I focus my mind this way with this attitude and I do this, I can figure this out and I can master this, right? So I reconnected with that time when I was 10 years old, made that decision, right? So that's the winner part of me. Now, when I come from that part, I have confidence, you know, rejection doesn't bother me. I don't have those thoughts. If I have an idea, you know, my mind sort of goes, oh, hey, yeah, people are going to love this idea. You know, totally different, right? And so that's what I'm talking about, you know, is like finding that place, and we've all experienced it, um, you know, um, I believe, to varying degrees perhaps, but if we can identify what, you know, the, the place in the past where we had the right kind of energy that we want right now, you know, this is what we want right now. We want this kind of focus, this kind of energy. If we can remember when we were in that place, go back there. Do it over, 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 over again, as long as it takes to really get good at working from that state, you know, that winner state, let's say, right? So that's, that's the... That's the process of sort of mental time travel and this whole, you know, this whole, this whole thing that I'm doing and have been doing now for years uh, is based largely on that, on that idea. Greg, you have any uh, comments uh, about that? Oh, that's great. Um, I think you've articulated something. That I've not heard again before. Uh, I, I haven't heard it that way. I mean, I think a lot of the things you are talking about, you know, kind of doing the techniques, uh, but I didn't see it in the bigger picture. Uh, you know, I think um, I, I think of a diploma on the wall, for example. You walk in doctor's office or you know, CPA's office or lawyer, and the diploma is on the wall, which certainly indicates all that past success, right? And you kind of validate him and they validate themselves probably through that identity. Um, right. So it's a little bit like that, but it's like a trigger, like a hook. Yeah. That when you see that diploma, it's, it puts you in the state of this guy has earned or woman, man or woman has earned some success and had, it's visible. And I was thinking of having little icons on the desk or <clears throat> photos kind of things that you might look at and say, that reminds me of the marathon I ran, or that reminds me of the 10 K I ran or, you know, little awards and placards too. Um, takes you to that state management or that great cold call. You get the, the sales awards that sit around, um, you know, and I think that's why managers do that is they can take you to that state. Um, but I was also thinking it was interesting when you defined it as a winner and loser. I can look at a, a boxing match and tell you who's going to win usually because you can see it in their eye. You can see the enthusiasm, the energy as to who's going to win the fight. And I think that that's because you have the winner mentality. And I think to be successful, you have to be in the winner mentality, I think, in all the areas. I, I had also told you I'd studied um, through psychology some depression, how to become depressed many years ago and how to be enthused. And basically, you take all the areas of your life like a wheel and you take the things you're good at and make the other ones like that. Or if you want to get depressed, you take the ones that are negative and you make the other areas like that. You kind of link it with your mind. You're doing the same thing or suggesting the same thing in the past to the future. You're saying, hey, look back to past successes, overlay that on you know what you're depressed about or what you're unenthused about, and to get, get excited about that. And from that energy is where your creation will come, where your better life will come from. So I think you'll be, um, you'll benefit from this technique, I guess, life-wise. I mean, you, you can, but I, and, and I didn't pick up on how you know, you're saying it, it is easy to grumble and complain. It's very easy. You know, if you want to grumble and complain, you, you can always have company when you walk in the room. It doesn't want to stay around for long. But, you know, in the long term, they start to realize, hey, this is not getting me anywhere. I mean, they kind of come to that conclusion. Or, and I think many people that are winners will move away from it. 
they'll say, hey, I don't, you know, they, they can feel that energy, they can feel that attitude, and so they'll move away. And I think that losers quite often have people running from them, um, socially or emotionally, you know, or giving up on they feel like they're being left behind by people that are probably positive. Um, so I think that that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it globally that way. I know that I have situations where my mind automatically goes to a negative. You know, I may be looking for, I think, um, you know, you're looking for problems. We all, you know, succeed by solving problems quite often. And that becomes the flavor of the day. I know I grew up as an auditor, as an accountant. And you're always looking for what's wrong. You know, you have sheets of what's wrong with your customer. You know, they're not doing this and this and this and this. And you, you write them out and you make a review comments. You'd say, hey, there's a hundred things wrong with your financial system. And, you know, that was what you were paid to do. And you're paid to, you know, when guys above you would correct you by saying what you did wrong. Hmm. So everybody was paying it as a career what you did wrong. But you get benefited by looking for those and reducing them. But it's also a pretty negative attitude. You know, and it's one of the reasons I left the career. I like sales more because I felt I could work with people that were that was more like I could see the salesmen were enjoying life <laughs> the auditors were you know primarily uh, I felt it was a very negative experience when I was younger um, but but I've kept the technique a little bit I think that we right. engineers accountants a lot of people like that are made to be critical problem solvers well everything's a problem right and well so, that's yeah that's good that so that um, that kind of leads me to the Another point that I was going to talk about today, but before I get into that, um, anybody else? Jessica, do you have any comments or feedback? Yeah, so what I was thinking about was you were talking about this gentleman who played in this show and how he had to get into character. Right. And I thought, okay, so who do I want to be and how do I get into that character? Yes. Right. And so that's what, so as, as you guys were talking, that's what I was writing down. It's like, okay, so what is the character of a best selling author? And I started writing down a list of all the things that I would have to be to play that character. So that's, that's where my mind kind of went. It's sort, of, it's sort of like the old uh, axiom, uh, fake it till you make it, right? Basically, well, yeah, you know, that's, that's, as yeah, fact that's, as if, right? Yeah, that's kind of related. Of course, faking it, you don't, you don't want to fake it. But you want to be it to some degree, right? But mm -hmm. in a sense, yeah. I mean, you pretend, you know, you get into the role. I mean, let's face it, the actors, they're faking it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're just acting. Mm -hmm. but, 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 of course, acting is a really high art, you know, that it takes, it takes practice. And, I mean, sometimes it takes years, right? It takes years for these actors to get to the place where they can get into character and they can be believable you see them and they and they go and you go wow you know that person looks like a killer or he looks like the king or she looks like the queen or you know whatever right um because they're so good at it but it's but it's difficult to maintain that um i was it reminds me of something i i was thinking about the other day in terms of like visualization right now, we tend to think of visualization like a visual thing, like an image, right? But this person was saying that, and it was, I think it was in the context of talking about prayer, right? And what they were saying is that you need to pray constantly. And so prayer, at least in this person's context, was what we're talking about, you know, visualizing ourselves with the lifestyle that we want, right? That's prayer, you know, it's like saying, hey, this is what I want, this is who I am, this is the lifestyle I want, this is the person I want to be, you know. And the idea of doing it constantly is like, you're so associated to that character, to that person, that you're it, right? So in a sense, somebody could say, well, he's faking it, you know. Uh, somebody from outside could say, well, you know, fake it till you make it. He's just faking. Well, it's kind of, you know, it's part of the process, right? I mean, actors will say that too, right? That 
you know, when they look back at some of their earlier work, they can, you know, they cringe because they seem so amateurish. Even though they might have been very successful. People thought they were great actors. But when they look at it, you know, they look at their performance then versus their performance now, they realize, oh man, I had no clue what I was doing then. I was just, you know, <laughs> I was just faking it, right? So yeah, so this idea of kind of being that character. You know, I remember that line from uh, Pulp Fiction, right? You remember when Jules and Vincent, they're, they're waiting for the right time. You know, they, they're going to go into this room at the beginning of the movie, right? And they're in the hallway. And uh, one of them says, time to get into character. You know, <clears throat> we're going to kill these guys. <laughs> so, um, so that... That kind of brings me to um, to this point that I was that I was going to mention. Um, now, one of the things that we have talked about recently was this idea of the metadata of our life. Have Have you heard that, Phil? Are you familiar with that? Uh, just vaguely. Yeah. So basically, you know, I picked up the term from James Cameron. I was watching an interview with him and he was talking about the movie, the Terminator. Right. And he said he, he had a dream one night and he saw this image of the Terminator, like Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of suddenly coming from the future. Right. And he said, it was just an image, but I realized that every image carries with it metadata. Like when you take a picture on your phone, you know, you can say, what are the details? And it'll tell you, Oh, here's the date it was taken, the time it was taken depending on the camera that you're using, it might give you the, you know, the focal length and the shutter speed and the aperture and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's metadata. So what I realized is that's what we're doing. That's what we're working with in this program here. We're working with the metadata of our life, right? And I sent out a worksheet the other day. I think you probably got it, Phil, about the metadata of our life. And the metadata are things like on a scale of 1 to 10, how much confidence do I have right now? On a scale of 1 to 10, how much do I feel like my life is on track? Right? So, I believe, my, my feeling about it is, that that metadata, those, those feelings that are kind of under the surface, we can tap into them just by asking that question, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much do I think this is going to work? You know, your mind might say, well, five out of 10, right? Which is a totally different feeling than, oh, 10 out of 10. So that's the metadata, right? So to my, to my way of thinking, that is like your aura, you know, you've heard this term aura, right? You know, when I was hanging around with psychics, uh, years ago, um, people talk about the aura. You know, you can see that person's aura. Well, I think what that is, what they mean is, oh, that's that person's metadata. You know, if somebody has like a lot of confidence, if somebody's really feeling great, you know, you're going to see it in their in their aura, right? It's like that's their energy level. You know what I mean? People say that's the vibration, right? So I was thinking the other day that um, you've heard this, you've heard this before, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder who you are or what you are, right? Right, Naomi? Right. Up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky, right? Well, do stars actually twinkle? No, it's the atmosphere. They don't twinkle. No. But it looks like they twinkle because we're looking through the atmosphere, right? So this James Webb telescope that they just put way out in space, I think it's a million miles from Earth. They put it there because it got a clear view of this of the stars, and of course, you know, apparently the information and the photographs it's bringing back are like, like nothing they've ever seen before, right? That was the reason for putting the Hubble telescope in orbit too, 
was to get past the atmosphere, right? Well, if that's, if the atmosphere is our aura, our metadata, our vibration, right? Then we're always going to be looking through that emotion, feeling, vibration, right? So everything that we see in the world is going to be distorted by that atmosphere, our personal atmosphere, right? Does that make sense? So like when I'm coming from my loser personality and I'm thinking of approaching somebody with an idea that they might want to go into partnership with me, the kind of thoughts I get are, well, I don't think they're going to be interested in this. They're probably going to think it's a silly idea, right? Well, that's because I'm seeing it through my loser atmosphere. But when I'm in the state where I'm like, hey, I'm invincible now, man. You know, I'm, I'm superstar, star student, you know, teacher's pet. And I think, you know, hey, I, I think I'm going to call this person see if they're interested in being my partner in this program here. Whatever it is I might be thinking about. Uh, then the star doesn't twinkle, you know, like. I feel great. Oh, yeah, they're probably going to be really interested in this. Does that make any sense? So we had a salesman come to our house one time. It was he was young. He was very young. And the first thing he saw or said when he, you know, he, I opened the door, he knocked in the door. He said, you probably won't want to buy anything from me, would you? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I said, no. Okay. <laughs> exactly well this is what we do right if we're not careful but i mean mm -hmm. it's you know it's not always yes and no it's like oh 80 percent versus 70 percent right mm -hmm. it's, it's a little more subtle you know i remember i was doing some door-to-door -door selling uh for a while when i was younger and i had this one job and the, and the and the guy who was sort of the the leader of the crew, you know, he had, he had, he had a few of us young guys working with him, you know, and I think they were selling encyclopedias or something like that. And so he said, he said to us, now you guys are just beginning. You're not going to make any sales today. So don't even think about making any sales. What I want you to do is to go knock on 20 doors and collect 20 no's. Because people are going to say no, you know. Are you interested in buying an encyclopedia? People are going to say no. So just write down the address, and then, you know, in, in an hour or two, we'll get together again in this coffee shop up the street, and you can show me your list of no's, right? So that was great. I thought, well, that's, that, well, that's easy, you know. So I knocked on about seven doors, and they, you know, are you interested in buying an encyclopedia? And they said, no. Okay, thank you. Right. Well, I think on the eighth door, I said, are you interested in buying an encyclopedia? And the person said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. <laughs> now what do you do? So I went, oh, okay. Well, he told me what to say. He said, okay, well, I'll talk to my associate and I'll have him come by in an hour or so and talk to you. So they said, okay, fine. So that's what I did. You know, I went back to the coffee shop with this guy and said, well, all these people said no, but this person said yes. So he said, great. You know, so he went back and I'm not sure if he sold them or not. He, he might have. Um, but I thought that was pretty slick, you know, because what he did was he removed all the fear that we had about trying to convince somebody to say yes. Because we, he said, just, just collect no's, right? Just collect the no's. I had a friend in Vancouver who now lives in Phoenix. Uh, he used to be the number one real estate salesman in Vancouver for like five years in a row. He averaged, I think, 50 houses a year. Now, if you know anything about real estate, selling 50 houses a year, like nobody does that, right? But this guy did, and he did it for like five years in a row. And then he decided he wanted to, uh, to move to Phoenix and specialize in 
and selling properties that were on golf courses. So Phoenix has all kinds of golf courses. So that's what he did. So he's, he, he's been living in Phoenix now for, well, I guess maybe 30 years. This was, this was quite a while ago. But, but that's what he used to do. You know, he would hire people. Like he would hire a student, let's say a high school student, you know. And he would say, okay, I want you to just go through the phone book, call these numbers. And when the person answers, say, hi, I'm calling on behalf of, um, his name was Don, Don Matheson, that's his name. So the person would say, hi, uh, I'm calling on behalf of Don Matheson. Are you by any chance thinking of buying or selling a house in the next six months? No. Okay, thank you. That was it, right? But if the person said, well, yeah, maybe, you know, they'd say, okay, I'll have Mr. Matheson give you a call. Same thing, right? So he was collecting leads from people, and this is how we sold. You know, he sold a house a week when other people were lucky to sell a house a month, you know. So, yeah, so this idea of, you know, the metadata and our aura, our energy kind of, um, that and how, it in, and how it interferes with our being able to see clearly what's going on around us because our vision is going to be distorted by our particular atmosphere, right? You know, the atmosphere that we're generating. Um, so I was watching something the other day about developing a habit. How long does it take to develop a habit? So when I was talking to Phil about, you know, finding that place in the past where you had that kind of energy and then just going back there and feeling it over and over and over again, you know, until it becomes automatic, right? So this person was a psychologist and he said, you know, people think it takes 21 days to establish a new habit. But he said the research shows that it could be anything from 21 days to 30 days to 60 days to 90 days to 256 days. <laughs> right? Which, of course, when you think about it, makes perfect sense, right? Because we're all different, you know. I mean, everybody has different things that they're doing in different emotional and intellectual aspects to their personality. So to say, oh, it takes 21 days, on the surface, it sounds wrong. How can it be 21 days for everybody, right? So I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, that he said it might be 30 days, might be 60 days, depending on you. It might be a year, you know. So the thing is, you know, do it until it works, right? Do it until you can connect with that emotion, that energy, that state, uh, whenever you want it, right? Uh, so, it, you know... And if it's important to you, well, you'll spend 60 days or 90 days or 120 days to do it. I was reading somewhere recently on the same subject and he said, it's not the length of time, it's the quantity of times you do it. Yeah, you do it until it works, right? I mean, if you were in show business and you were a juggler, you know, and you were practicing a trick or like if you were a magician practicing a card trick or something, you know, you wouldn't practice it for 21 days and say, well, I, I can't do it yet, so obviously it's not going to work. You'd say, no, I'll keep doing it until I can do it, right? I'll keep doing it so I can do it with my eyes closed. So, um, any feedback, any comments on that so far? A lot of good notes today. Yeah, good. So the other, one other thing that I was going to mention, it's, it's basically the same thing. It's like getting in character, right? Um, but I, I coined this phrase, at least for myself, when I was quitting smoking, right? Because when I was quitting smoking, I was a smoker. And I wanted to be a non-smoker. And so what I realized was, because I was using those cue cards, we've, we've talked about the cue cards, and one of the cue cards that I had said, I'm a non-smoker. And what I noticed was, every time I read that cue card, it wasn't true. 
So I thought, well, that's interesting. Why is it not true, right? Well, eventually what I figured out was that I, I had defined a non-smoker as a person who didn't have any cravings to smoke. And I was still getting cravings, even after like a month. Even though I hadn't smoked for a month and my little quit smoking plan was working, I didn't feel like a non-smoker. When I, when I read that little cue card that said, I am a non-smoker, my body you said, no, you're not. So I said, well, why? Why am I not a non-smoker? I haven't smoked for a month. And of course, as soon as I asked myself that question, I remembered making that decision, which was, I want to get to the point where I don't have any cravings. Because a non-smoker doesn't have any cravings. Well, as soon as I thought about that, I realized, well, that's kind of illogical. How do I know if they have any cravings or not? I could walk into a room full of people who are not smoking and think, oh, there's a whole room full of non-smokers here. I wouldn't have any idea how many of them might have a craving to smoke. They just weren't smoking, right? So I changed the definition. And I changed the definition of a non-smoker to a person who is dealing with whatever cravings they get. They might get a craving to smoke, but they can deal with it and they don't smoke. They, they don't give in to the craving, right? So I called that moving from the land of smoking to the land of non-smoking. And once I made that decision, once I changed that definition of what a non-smoker was, I realized, oh, hey, I'm already a non-smoker because I'm dealing with these cravings I'm getting. I had these different ways of dealing with the cravings, right? And so I thought, well, I'm already a non-smoker. So then the next time I read that cue card that said, I'm a non-smoker, I went, yeah, <laughs> that's right, I am now, right? The craving was irrelevant. But it was just something that I thought, which is a good lesson because what I believe is that all the obstacles that we face, you know, the definitions that we use, the self-image problems that we have, and, you know, the different things that we're dealing with, they're most of the time, maybe all the time, but I, I'll be a little flexible there and say most of the time. Most of the time, it's something that we created ourselves. We made a decision in the past that is now popping up and rearing its ugly head and preventing us from doing it. And we've talked about this in the past. We talked about it with Jessica wanting to move and feeling like, no, I shouldn't move. I don't know why, but I just don't feel like it. Realizing that she made a decision when her son was very young that she needed to stay close to him. 25 years later or 20 years later, it's like that's still in her mind. And that thought that, no, I can't move because I need to stay close to my son. She had forgotten about that. The same as I had forgotten to say, you know, about making a decision that a non-smoker is a person who doesn't have to deal with any cravings. And Naomi, we talked about her and, you know, having this person give her a pie and she thought, oh, because the person gave me the pie, now I can't stick to my diet plan of not eating sweet things because this person gave me the pie and I need to be polite and kind and and thank her for it. And I can't do that unless I eat it. So I have to eat the pie, but I don't want to eat the pie. So now what do I do? So I said, oh, eat a, eat a fork full of pie. And that's it. Stop after a, after a fork full. Oh, wow, brilliant, you know. So the solution, once we find the solution, is pretty simple, right? Redefine what a non-smoker is from somebody who doesn't have any cravings to somebody who can deal with the cravings. Or I can still be a good person and thank my friend for giving me the pie. All I have to do is taste a little bit of it so I can have integrity when I say to them, hey, I tasted the pie, it was delicious, thanks so much. Right? Make sense? So the job that we have is to figure out what those little decisions were that we made in the past. Like it took me a long time to realize I made a decision to join the losers. I've forgotten about that. 
I thought, why is my life, you know, I used to have such a good life, you know. I was a winner, and now here I am struggling and feeling like a loser. What's going on? And then I, eventually I figured out, well, yeah, I decided to be a loser. I forgot about that. <laughs> right? So I've been watching a lot of Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's talking about time travel. He's, he's really big on time travel, this guy, which is great because I am too, right? And But one of the things that he hasn't picked up on, by the way, I wrote to him, Jessica, do you remember we were talking about, I watched one of these videos and I wanted to comment on it, and you said, well, you can write to him, so I wrote to him, you know. Um, one of the things, if you read any of the quantum physics, you know, time travel literature, one of the things about it is, if you were to exceed the speed of light, if a particle were to exceed the speed of light, it would go through a wormhole, and therefore it would be in two places at once. Well, that's perfect, because that's exactly what we do. My feeling is that our inner focus, our inner mental focus, is like a tachyon that's going faster than the speed of light. You know, like when I remember being five years old, I can, my mind goes back to that time right now. It, just, it doesn't take any time at all to remember being five years old. And so my consciousness is in two places at once. It's back at five years old and it's here. It's in the present and it's in, you know, in this case, I guess, 1952 or 1953. So I think that's a great concept. Any comments, Naomi? No, not really. My mind is going and I'm writing down, you know, I'm, I'm back at the beginning of this call doing that meditation right. and identifying. <laughs> right. Well, that's what our mind does, right? Like our, like our mind is yeah. a time machine. I mean, thinking is a time machine. I say every thought is a is an instance of time travel. Uh, people go, what? what are you talking about time travel? You know. Um, so, Phil, I have a question. Yes, sir. You, you, you have this goal now of building your business, right? Yep. How strong is your why? Pretty strong. Uh, it could be stronger, probably. On a scale of 10? 8. So how would you make it stronger? Um, good question. Do you want the answer? <laughs> yeah, if you got a, if you got a, uh, an idea. Mm -hmm. Naomi, do you know the answer? Do, do you want to venture an answer? Do you, you believe in your heart that you're a 10? Well, uh, yeah, that's possible. That's one way to do it. Jessica, do you have any ideas? Uh, I guess just um, think deeper about your why. Like really attach the emotion and the feeling of what it is that you want and why you want it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, here's what I would suggest. Uh, you have a sheet in your in your workbook called "What's It Worth to Me," which okay. is your why, right? Okay. So, what is it worth to me? But you. You have six different facets to your personality. At least that's what I work on, you know. You have the physical side, mental side, spiritual side, family side, social side, and financial side, right? So fill out those, fill out that worksheet. What's it worth to me? Fill it out as detailed as you can in all six areas. What's it worth to me financially? What would it mean family-wise? How would it help my kids? How would it help my grandkids? 
how would it help my church? You know, how would it, it move me ahead spiritually, right? Oh, well, I might have more money to contribute to, to the church. I yeah, belong. you know, you know that, that is, that's really great because I've been kind of thinking of it. It's kind of, I was thinking of it in a, kind of an, amor an amorphous way, like, like all of it, but not, but by compartmentalizing it into those segments, then it becomes possible to make it more tangible and, uh, you know, it uh, it organizes your, my my thoughts about it. Whereas before, without organize that organization, I'm kind of bouncing around. Yeah, and it's just it's overwhelming. Exactly, and you're probably going to have two or three reasons, you know, that you think about over and over and over again, yeah. which which may be perfectly fine reasons, you know, and, perfectly and Anthony, fine I things. I want to thank you because uh, it seems like uh, you know a lot of the you know, the support that's offered by the leaders of these various companies, you know, I mean, if you go to a convention or if you go to a, you know, but, but now with the internet, you know, it's all online, but they're always, you know, you got to find about, out about your why, but they don't give you, <laughs> they don't give you a, any guidance towards how to break that down. So exactly. I really, really, yeah. really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So what would it mean to Meg, you know? Mm -hmm. What would it mean to Nicholas? Right? Yeah. You know, what would it mean to the church? What would it mean? So, I mean, it's all about you, but it's about you in those different areas, right? So, like, how would it, how would it pay off for you socially with your friends and your family and... And, you know, go for 5, 10, 15 things on each one of those lists, right? Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, imagine the more the better, be right? Yeah, and it's just, to me, this just feels like like it's a way of breaking the dam, you know. Um, exactly, yeah. it's just looking at it, you know, in in different areas, right? And so, as Jessica said, drill down, you know, like you might say, well, it would help me with Nicholas, you know, because I could uh, I I could help him more, right? Yeah, and. So drill down into that, you know, like what would happen, you know, how would I feel if I could go down and spend some time with Bonnie and Nicholas? Bonnie is Phil's daughter and Nicholas is her son. How would, how would it be if I could go down there, spend a little time with them and present them with a big check? You know, what, how, would, how would they react? What would they feel like? What would, how would I feel seeing the smile on, on their face? You know what I mean? Like really drill down into that because the more you drill down, the more you're going to hit upon something and, and you're going to go, oh, that's a key piece of insight, you know, seeing the smile on Bonnie's face or, you know, whatever. She gives me a big hug and says, thank you, Dad, you know. That's a much more tangible payoff for you, right? Than than just saying, "Oh, well, I want to increase my income." Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. I I need to I need to go. Yeah, I realize that. Um, and and I'll be back uh, week after next. Great. Great. Okay. Well, have a good time on that retreat. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks, man. So, Greg, did you hear some of that? Uh, I had to step out for a second, so I missed that. I'll have to pick it up on the recording. Well, luckily, uh, we're recording it. So, What's that? I said, luckily, we are recording it, so uh, that's great. Hopefully, it'll make prime time. <laughs> that's right. So, um, I think... I think we're doing good here, time-wise. Uh, any any final comments before we um, hit the road? No, this this really was a, a good session. It was a realignment session for me. Yeah, getting back to so, basics, kind of, right? Yeah, yep. In a sense, it's all basics. You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. It's like the base, you know, the baseball coach saying, "Okay, get in the batting cage." You know, hit, hit a thousand balls, right? Um, 
Because if we're not careful, you know, we tend to get into the, you know, the airy fairy, oh, changing my life, you know, whatever. And we forget that it comes down to the, you know, these little, little things, right? Mm -hmm. I remembered a past success that I hadn't written down before. And um, that really, that feeling of that past success, I, I think is really going to carry me forward a lot faster and easier, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very good point. So, I mean, you might have a hundred past successes on your list, but they're not all equal, right? Right. Some of them are kind right. of like, ah, so what? You know, it's not a big deal. But every once in a while, you find one, you go, hey, you know, this this is really keen. Like when I was when I was mentioning a few minutes ago, remembering, and I can remember it because I found it. Right. I mean, I sort of searched in my past and I and I remembered this particular evening I was sitting upstairs in my bedroom doing my math homework and I was having this. I had this one math problem that I couldn't figure out, so I almost went, oh, OK, forget it. I'll just leave it and I'll talk to the teacher tomorrow. Right. And I made a decision. Okay, oh, I said, let me interrupt. I apologize. Yeah. But what my past success that I just remembered was was the certain the I got the top score in a math class <laughs> and here you refer right. I can't believe you just mentioned a math anyway so sorry for the interruption no 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 that's great that's great but I remember you know I remembered and it took a while to remember it right but I mean uh, you know I more or less meditate like this every day, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this system here. And I remember this one evening I was doing this homework, and I, and I almost quit and said, okay, well, I can't figure this question out, you know, I'm just, I'll just leave it, and I'll go watch TV or something, you know. And I remember thinking, no, I'm just gonna stick at this until I get it, right? So I just stuck at it and stuck at it and stuck at it. And finally it was like, ah, oh, hey, wait a second. Now I see, now I get it, right? And that that memory of kind of that realization that if I focus and I persist, I can figure it out. That was a real key insight, you know, for me. So, so I've been reconnecting with that little guy, um, recently and it's powerful you know it's like one of the most powerful uh, memories that i have so yeah how ironic <laughs> yeah so greg any questions comments no it's just great stuff i mean i uh you know life continues to present opportunities to either have problems or our solutions in a positive attitude um my mind tends to wander back to being critical and so I've got to continue to, you know, kind of have a, a renewal process where I recognize that aura. I think you were saying it, Jessica, you're like, uh, I think last time you said you have a dark cloud, you know, kind of over you at that moment. And it was, you sometimes can get into a discussion where you kind of go into that role um, too. But I think it's to be aware of it because it could become more permanent where it's, you know, often. And, um, yeah, you know, sometimes you're grind. You know, I'm a kind of a grinder in terms of work. You know, there's a lot of times I make a lot of calls, and you know, you're kind of grinding through that no list. It's easy to become skeptical, like that salesperson, where you're, you know, you are meeting, you know, probably 99 people say no, and you know, one person is saying yes, particularly with my career. But life is like that too, in all all the mm -hmm. other areas. Uh, you know, you're having struggles when you're lifting weight to lift right or getting to the gym on time, and you know, you're you can have some failures that I think make us skeptical in doing that. So that's, that's important to realize it becomes your filter if you're not careful and um, just kind of backing out and looking at dis, you know, disassociating, looking at the big picture, I think is important. Well, you said something earlier that I'm just going to remind you of because uh, it might be important, right? It might be important. You know, this idea of the, of the metadata, right? And the idea that, uh, you know, we have this atmosphere around through which we look at everything, right? And, and, and we forget it's there. You know, we forget the atmosphere is there. So you said something a few minutes ago that when you were trained as an accountant and you were working as an accountant, you automatically would look for problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
you're sampling, you're doing sampling, you're looking at vouchers, for example, or, you know, checks and looking for one with an error on it. Right. But are that they, might they... be, but that might be a mindset that obviously was valuable. It was a valuable tactic when you were doing your accounting before looking at the, all these numbers and saying, okay, where, what, what's the problem here? What, what is, what could indicate a, you know, a difficulty or a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's not an appropriate question to ask in the situation you're in now. Like it might be automatic. Right. So, you know, so automatic that maybe you don't even notice that you're going, okay, what's the problem? You know, what could go wrong, right? Hmm. As opposed to what right. could go right. You know? Well, I mean, I think to be able to observe and, and look at it and say, hey, if, you know, if you're looking at problems all the time, that's a problem. That yeah. is the problem. Because right? you're going to find you're, them, right? I mean, if you look, you know, seeking you shall find, right? You're going to find it. <laughs> well, but um, I mean, you can also be in denial of the problem, right? You cannot be seeing what's going on. And say, hey, this is becoming a methodology that's not a productive one. I could have the flip side of it, which is to always be looking for the opportunity, too. I mean, so I, I think there's being aware, but there's being, you know, you, you've got to have, it's like fear. Fear has a purpose. I mean, if you have, a, you know, someone come attack you in the dark, you know, you should run. <laughs> Probably, yeah, right? Exactly. You know, I mean, there's, a, there's a purpose for that and biologically and things like that. But there's a difference between you know, having a dangerous event happen and responding appropriately versus thinking everything's dangerous. Exactly. You know, or, exactly. You know, you know. You're doing that. Um, okay. Well, great. Thanks, you guys, for being here. And uh, we'll see you next week for number 56. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See ya. For information about this online community, to get your own copy of the book upon which this entire training series is based, either the ebook, the paperback, or the audiobook, go to learntodesignyourlife.com, where you can also get a free copy of this Design Your Life workbook.